Hello, Keith from the future here. In this video, I'm going to be doing five major table saw upgrades, but first I wanted to explain how I decided which table saw to keep and use in the workshop going forward. There are timestamps in the video if you want to skip around, but now here's Keith from the past. A few weeks back, I posted a video reviewing the Lumberjack TS1800 table saw. And if you saw that video, you'll know that I had a really hard time deciding whether to keep it and use it as my main table saw in the workshop or to stick with my current saw, the Axminster AT254SB. And it's taken me several weeks to figure out what to do. As part of the review video, I wrote a long list of advantages for each model. And for my circumstances, the Lumberjack seemed to have more advantages than the Axminster. But I recognized that that was an oversimplified way of looking at it because of those advantages, some are really important and some are not so important. And as usual, whenever I'm struggling to make a decision, I make a spreadsheet. I came up with a point scoring system for each of the advantages mentioned, and I'll show that on screen now. Each advantage is rated with a score of one to 10, one being least important, 10 being most important. And there'll be a few bits that might look a bit odd here, so let me explain. Starting with the Lumberjack, better dust extraction might seem like it's rated unfairly low, but that's because I already have a good solution in place for extraction from my Axminster saw. And that solution is to use two extractors, an HVLP extractor hooked up to the cabinet and a vacuum extractor hooked up to the crown guard. It works well and it's already set up like that. The long arbor might seem unfairly low too, but it's of no use to me as I'm never going to use dado blades. And then onto the Axminster, it has a preferable blade guard, but I've rated that as zero importance. And that's because it fits both saws. So I can just buy another one of those and fit it to either saw. When I total up all of those points and add a traffic light system just to prove how much of a geek I am, the Lumberjack is still clearly on top. And at this point, it was clear to me that if I didn't have a table saw and I wanted to buy one of those two saws, the Lumberjack would be my first choice. Not only because the Axminster saw is now discontinued and no longer available for sale, but also because the Lumberjack is just a clearly better option for me. But that's not the whole story either because I needed to factor in a few other considerations, like the fact that if I keep the Axminster, I wouldn't need to make any new jigs. Currently, I already have a crosscut jig, a finger joint jig, and a panel cutting jig. And to be honest, unlike many other YouTube woodworkers, I strongly dislike making jigs because I'd rather spend time actually making projects. Additionally to that, the table of the Lumberjack was a good 75 millimeters or three inches taller than the Axminster. And that means I'd need to raise my outfeed workbench by 75 millimeters and also my main workbench too, because I've often found it useful to have all my work surfaces at the same height, especially when working on long things like skirting boards, for example. I don't really want to raise the height of my workbenches by 75 millimeters. So I thought if I'm incapable of making a decision, why don't I post a poll to both YouTube and Instagram to get the opinion of my viewers? But all that did was muddy the waters even more because on both platforms, the Axminster won with a score of 62% on Instagram and 56% on YouTube. But just how important to me are the opinions of my viewers anyway? Well, that's gonna have to be a 10, of course. So that was that, the Lumberjack had to go and I'm pretty gutted about it to be honest, but obviously I couldn't keep both of them and I had to make a decision because working around two big table saws, even in a reasonably well-sized workshop like this one, was getting pretty frustrating. Right, so with that decision made, that whole process has made me realize that there are five things that I simply cannot live with anymore. So let's have a look at some table saw upgrades. The first big issue is maneuverability. The Lumberjack had four swivel casters, so you could just engage the casters and move it in any direction. It was brilliant. Back when I bought the Axminster, I also bought the primitive and very annoying wheelbase that Axminster sells with only two swivel casters, along with these annoying hand screw knobs that you need to twist in order to fix the table saw's position. And that lack of maneuverability means that whenever I need to move the saw, like when I need to cut something particularly large, or when I want to use my router table with more infeed space so that my services column thing doesn't get in the way, I have to do a multiple point turn to get it where I want it to be. So let's see if we can figure that one out first. Watching back this footage, all I can really think is why on earth did I not put on some steel toe cap boots for this? Anyway, I managed to get the mobile base out eventually. 
Measuring from my workbench top to the underside of the base gave me a reading of 15 millimeters. So I need to remember that so that I can space my new wheels to match that. And I can get those pesky non-swiveling wheels removed. Before I go and buy any new casters, I thought I should check to see what I have already. And I pulled out some of these 75 millimeter casters. These are still available to buy. And when I looked them up, they are rated for a weight limit of up to 250 kilograms. That's for all four casters combined, not for each caster. And when I looked up the weight of my table saw online, it was showing as 184 kilograms. And I think that's without the two additional cast iron tables that I added. So I think I'm pushing my luck here, to be honest, in terms of weight. But if the casters were to break, I can always replace them later. These wings at the side are going to get in the way, so I get those cut off. I'm going to need something really strong for this, so I went to my shed where I have some old bits of metal, and I have this piece of 8mm thick steel, which should be perfect. And from this I'm going to cut two plates that I can secure my casters to. I guess it cleaned up a bit with a flap disc, and then spray on some satin black to protect the metal and stop it rusting. And I have some M6 bolts that I can use to secure the casters to the plate. I'm going to need a little spacer block to lift up the casters to the correct height and for that I have a piece of old plastic chopping board so I get a couple of pieces cut to size and I super glued those in place just to hold them there temporarily and then with the plate and the spacer clamped to the top of the mobile base I get some 8mm holes drilled all the way through and some M8 bolts fitted. That seems to work nicely, but will it support the weight of the saw? Let's find out. All seems okay so far, and now I can very easily maneuver the table saw back and forth depending on where I need it to be. And I'll let you know in future if the casters buckle under all this weight, but I reckon they'll be okay. The second big issue is the insert plate. Messing about with tiny machine screws every time I want to change a blade is infuriating. So I need to design and make a toolless insert plate. The insert plate that's fitted at the moment I made in a previous video, so I'll leave a link to that in the description box if you want to see how I made that one. But for the new one, I found some 12mm MDF that has an oak veneer on the front, although it's not a veneer, it's some plasticky fake wood laminate type thing that came out of an offcuts bin at my local DIY store. I used double sided tape to stick down the insert plate that came with my saw, as I'm going to use this as a template and I should be able to get two plates from this one board. I fitted a bearing guided flush trim bit but then realised that I couldn't get the bearing referencing around the plate while still getting a full cut with the cutter, all because of the small gap between the bearing and the cutter, so I taped on a shim as a spacer which should solve that issue. And that did the trick. This tape unfortunately left some residue, so I cleaned it off with some white spirit. A bit of sanding to ease over the sharp edges, and then I measured the lips that support the plate on the saw. They're about 15mm on the side, and only about 3mm at the back. I'll use a straight bit to remove enough material to get the plate sitting on those lips. I just need to keep raising the cutter in between cuts until the grooves are cut to the right depth. The plate needs to be about 3.3mm to sit flush to the table, and that's what I call close enough. And then I just need to shimmy over the fence a little bit to finish up. There are these lugs sticking out which I need the insert plate to fit around, and I started trying to cut those freehand at the router table, but I got a couple of catches, and it felt a bit sketchy, so I decided just to chisel instead. And just when I thought I was almost there, I realised there was another sticky outy bit. Honestly, these tool manufacturers don't make it easy for us, do they?
I then measured the thickness of the table at the back and that was about 8mm and I want to add something to hook under the underside of the table to keep the plate secure so I just used a couple of large washers for that. But as my insert plates are 12mm thick and the table is only 8mm I decided to add a little shim to the inside of the table with some super glue so that in future I can just make all my insert plates using 12mm material. I added a couple of coats of spray varnish to keep the insert plates nice and durable. I drilled an 18mm finger hole so that I can take the plate out easily. And then I can finally cut the kerf slot. I need to extend this slot though to allow it to fit over my riving knife and I did that with my Japanese pull saw and that's the toolless insert plate done. I would have liked to have found a way to secure it down to the table at the front. Some people embed magnets within the insert plate to hold it down to the cast iron table. But unfortunately with this saw that's not possible because the insert plate just isn't thick enough where it's in contact with the table. I did think about whether I could make some kind of latch but I couldn't figure out a way of doing that. Another option would be to drill out a hole so that I can just secure it with one screw at the front. Certainly undoing one screw would be better than six or however many there are. But I'm hoping because it's a nice snug fit that it'll be okay as it is. The third big issue is the measurement marker on this fence which is just a stupid design. It only serves to distort the measurement rather than help you read it and it's got to go. And with any luck what's inside this box should solve all of my problems. This is a package from Carl at Strawbite Workshop. He makes a range of 3D printed products, some of which you may have seen on my channel before like the track saw cover and the track saw waist side jigs. But this one he kindly designed specifically with me in mind. These measurement markers are a new design by Carl which are still being prototyped. I'll mention some of the clever features and suggestions that I've made for improvements but by the time this video goes up Carl should have some new versions which he'll have available on his website which I'll link to below. I removed the plastic end caps and then using some short 6mm bolts and square nuts they secure in place to the rails. I'll need to replace my measurement scales on the fence rails for this. Fortunately I had a couple of extras in my drawer already that came with my saw but these are cheap to buy anyway. I just need to clean off the residue and then I can refit my end caps. I can then butt my fence up to the blade and align the zero marker to the inside marker. This is how I decided to fit them anyway but there's plenty of versatility with these. And then I do the same again on the left hand side of the blade. This measurement scale was a bit screwed up but I hardly ever use my fence on this side anyway so it'll do for now. I can then test it out for accuracy so I set the fence to cut to 200mm, cut a piece of plywood and then measured it with a tape measure that I trust and that looks good. Obviously one of the main features of these markers is that they're fully adjustable so you can really dial them in for accuracy. I also like that they sit really close to the rail, about 2mm, so they are much easier to read than the old markers. The outer markers are designed for use with an auxiliary fence, although the one that came with my saw is 110mm wide, so these new markers wouldn't be compatible with this. But I'm not a fan of this auxiliary fence anyway for reasons which I'll come on to later in the video, so at some point I'll make a new auxiliary fence that is compatible with these markers. You've got about 45mm reach on these, so that's the maximum of how wide you'd want that auxiliary fence to be. Another feature of these markers is that they can be designed to be the same thickness as the kerf of your blade, meaning that you can account for the blade thickness on certain cuts too, similarly in concept to how the straw bite waist side jigs work with the track saw. On these prototype versions though the marker measures 3.18mm and my blade is 0.3mm narrower at 28 but again I understand that Carl is going to stock these in a range of different sizes for different blade kerfs. You'll see that there is a little bit of deflection but they tend to just bounce back to where they were originally. So it's not something I'm worried about but I have suggested to Carl whether he might be able to include a little triangle just to support the tab here, particularly on these longer measurement markers. But I guess you could do the same for the top one as well. Knowing Carl he's probably already had the same thought process, maybe that might create some compatibility issues but I'm sure Carl can provide an update on that. Right a few days have passed and Carl has just sent to me these version 2 of the pointers you'll see they now have that triangular support piece and I think the kerf on these has been adjusted as well to match my blade 2.89mm perfect 
The fourth issue I had is with the fence and getting it into alignment with the blade and the table. When I lock it, it skews a little bit to the right each time. Adjustment of the fence is made via four Allen key bolts, but in practice, whenever you try and set it and then tighten the bolts, the fence shifts a little when you tighten them. The solution to this one is a bit of a hack, and once again, it came from Carl at Straw Bite Workshop, who suggested that I add some shims to the aluminium rails. Having just recently removed my old measuring tapes from the fence, I thought, what the heck, it's worth a try, so I super glued these two bits of tape onto the inside, as shown here, this seems to have completely resolved the issue. There is now no play when I slide the fence back and forth, and to be honest, it's a little bit tight. There's a bit of friction now, so it takes a bit more effort to move, but I'm sure with a bit of use, once the tape wears a little, it'll be fine. And now when I lock the fence in place, it aligns parallel to the blade every time, no more skewing. I'm well chuffed with that, especially as I was thinking about designing and building a new fence for this saw, and now I don't have to do that, which is a big relief, so thanks again to Carl for that. The final issue is with making narrow rip cuts. As standard, the crown guard that comes with this saw and many other Axminster saws, by the way, has this knob attached to the right-hand side, which limits how close you can set the fence to the blade. The solution to this is to use the auxiliary fence that comes with the saw, but that means adding two knobs and bolts, and for some reason I can never find those bolts, they always seem to go missing. And you might think that the solution to this would be easy by taking the pin out and rotating it 180 degrees, but the problem with that is that there's a slight offset here with the flat area on the pin which the crown guard is designed to pivot on. So in other words, they've deliberately designed this so that it can only be fit with the knob on the right, perhaps more evidence that the people who design tools don't seem to use them. I previously made a slight improvement to this by removing the knob and adding just a regular washer and wing nut which allowed me to get the fence a little bit closer. But when I searched online for crown guards to see if there were any better solutions available to buy, I found the same crown guard as I already have, but with the knob on the left-hand side. So I thought I would order one to find out, and when I got it out of the box, the knob was on the right-hand side. So I thought, that's annoying. Obviously, the image that they've used to market this is incorrect. I'll have to send it back. But then I found in the box there was an extra pin included, this time with the flat spot offset the other way so that the knob can be fitted on the left hand side. In hindsight, I'm not convinced that this is much of an improvement over just using the wing nut on the right hand side, seeing as you need space for a push stick when making a narrow rip cut anyway. But still, it's nice to have it out of the way. Was it worth £35 though? Probably not. So in other words, I've bought a new crown guard with two pins when really all I needed was one pin. Whether Axminster will sell just this pin on its own or not, I'm not sure, but if you're interested in the same solution, I'd definitely recommend contacting them to find out. And I guess now at least I have a spare crown guard in case the other one breaks. I think I've solved all of my major issues with the table saw now. Obviously, a special thanks to Carl at Strawweight Workshop. I'll leave a link to his website in the description box. Please do check it out. Thanks for watching.